Okay, good evening, uh, friends, Romans, countrymen, and everybody else who's uh, here at the slightly earlier time of 6.30 this evening. Good evening. Welcome to Shelf Analysis episode. I've stopped counting. I have. I think it's 55. I'm fairly sure it's 55. Um, thanks, Amelia, for joining us a little bit earlier this evening. You probably know that that is because the Unpost Irish Book Awards are taking place at 7.30 tonight, in case you didn't. That's why we moved slightly earlier this evening. Uh, the Book Awards are on tonight at 7.30 on RTE Culture. Uh, so we thought we didn't want to ruin their party for them and risk having nobody paying attention to us on the biggest night in Irish books. Um, so thanks a million for uh, switching on a little bit earlier tonight. I have a couple of things to do before we get to uh, tonight's guest. A couple of things I want to tell you about. Um, first thing I'm going to start with this. Of course, the Dublin Book Festival is beginning at the moment. They have a ton of events that are happening over the next couple of weeks. One of the ones that I'm involved in is in association with the Unpost Irish Book Awards and the National Library of Ireland. It is Voices, an open door book of stories uh, where I talk to Carlo Gebler and to Helen Ryan, who's from the National Adult Literacy Agency, uh, which, of course, are one of the people who are involved with the Voices series of books. That's talking to me. They'll be reading some Dermot Bulger and Emily Hurricane as well. Good news is it's free and it's on at three o'clock on Saturday, December 5th. You'll find the details for that and everything else, of course, on the Dublin Book festival website uh, that's got to be there as well as that let me give you a few other bits and pieces as well that i want to uh, give a shout out to our christmas appeal we started it last week uh, again just in case you weren't around we are fundraising this year in the ricochet book club for the dspca for the samaritans ireland and for the peter mcvery trust as well thank you so much for all of your donations so far we're about 12 13 days into this there is eight and a half thousand euro already in the pot that's to go with the eighty-five thousand euro that we've raised over the last uh, two years for charitable causes if you'd like to donate something if you're in the ricochet book club now you'll find it i post about it all the time uh, you can look up my twitter handle if you want to find out the details of where you can donate to this year's appeal and again all we ask as per usual is the price of a book if at all possible, and if you can put something our way that is being equally divided between the DSPCA and the Samaritans and the Peter McVeary Trust. Uh, in case you weren't around for this last week as well, we're running a Christmas festival. The Ricochet Book Club Christmas Festival 2020 is on December 14th to December 17th. Uh, four events, four nights on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of that week, all here live on the Shelf Analysis YouTube channel and in the Ricochet Book Club as well. Uh, it's a poetry event on the Monday night. Tuesday night is going to be Books of the Year. Wednesday night is a book quiz. And the Thursday is the big old-fashioned Christmas party. I have asked 10 authors to participate over the course of this so far. Nine of them have immediately said yes. Number 10 is just waiting to see if he has us just to maneuver something. And I will have the original 10 people I wanted for this festival. And um, part of it was because, of course, we're not going to get to get together and have an actual physical event like we did last year in Easton's in Dublin. Uh, so the idea is we'll do a book uh, club Christmas festival. All the details of that in the Ricochet Book Club in Facebook as well. I don't have much else to talk to you about, to be honest with you, because I want to get to tonight's guest. And um, he's a, a guy who I spoke to. I wanted to talk to for a really long time. And I talked to him on the book show on Radio 1 um, quite recently. Uh, about a lot of things and then i thought that in the run up to christmas and particularly given what we did this week already here on shelf analysis where we had some experts on talking about kids books it might be nice to have somebody on who actually writes children's books for a living uh, to talk about books that he loves and books that maybe you think uh, that you might love as well uh here i go firstly i quite like i'm going to press this button here uh three two one in theory and say hello to frank cottrell boys frank cottrell boys how are you sir i am good <laughs> now when we spoke a couple of minutes ago, you said, this isn't my moustache. It no, it's like November. Your I've been blagged into, you know, growing a penitential. I mean, your facial furniture is beautiful, but... It's it's long-standing. That's it. It's been, there for, <laughs> it's been there forever. You've grown into it. My son keeps saying you look like a Greek fascist. <laughs> <laughs> and I, looking at me now, I mean, I'm very... Are you, like, the big effect of all the lockdowns to me is I am very, very sick at the sight of my own face. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I, I I look at you. You see, what I'm doing is I'm not looking at myself ever, uh, ever. Do you know? What I think I look like. Do you know the brother in the Mouth and the Goblin? Okay. Yeah, I think this is what I think the brother looks like. Possibly one half of the Chuckle Brothers as well. I'm not sure if that's offensive <laughs> yes, or not. That's, that's why. Go that's why it's not a literary thing. It's the Chuckle <laughs> Brothers. That's what it is. Um, Frank, thanks a million for for, for coming on the program um, tonight. Um, for those people who who maybe think they don't necessarily know you, they do in terms of the movies that you've screen written and in terms of their kids probably knowing you through the books that you've written over the last few years um, yeah. uh, as well. Um, 
My first question to everybody on this, because it's a series that started at the very beginning of uh, lockdown and because it was done as a result of that is, how have the last few months treated you both uh, as, as a writer and personally? How have you been dealing with, with everything since February, March of this year? Um, I mean, my next door neighbour always says to me, so you've condemned yourself to a life of homework. So in, in a sense, it's made no difference. You know, you are kind of relatively isolated and in fact less so because I think as a children's writer you're always being asked to go into schools and geography is a great defense it's you know yeah I'd love to come to your school in Shanghai but you know and of course that's geography has disappeared hasn't it geography has been obliterated so I was on um I've done a lot of zooming of schools a lot of zooming of schools and at the beginning in a very kind of altruistic way I thought a lot about kids who had no gardens and things you know it was like I think that's the big social divide if you've got a garden it was kind of great that summary like that you know back in the old days we had lovely lockdowns with big summery days and it was just fun and kids these days they have these like i feel nostalgic about the first lockdown um and i did um creative writing lessons on instagram for kids which was great but it turned into kind of a full-time job i had this wonderful thing that i would i would do like a reading and set an exercise on a monday and then they would uh sending their questions and I would do questions and answers on Wednesday. And then I realized that, um, and I, I the, and then I, the work would be read out on a Friday. So it was, it was like a, through the week, you know, mm. and I realized quite quickly that there were lots and lots of quite famous actors whose phone numbers I had or emails I had who mm -hmm. were doing nothing. So these kids, like they were having their little stories read out by, we had Siobhan McSweeney and Maxine Peake, Steve Coogan, Lexi Sale, uh, you know, lots and lots of big, big name actors. It was great, really good. Because by the time you get to lockdown too, obviously everybody's a bit battle hardened. They're not taking your calls. They're going, oh, another, another reading on Instagram. Do I really want to? Yeah, to do yeah, that? stop doing it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and and how was it for, for you as a writer? I mean, have you, have you gotten much work done beyond that, or did you feel yeah. the need to throw yourself into in, into those kinds of things? No, I, I've. Um... I wrote a book, which was great. And I, I kind of realized that the only fun I was going to have was writing. And I also realized that it had stopped being fun. You know, it had become a job. So I sort of changed my writing practices altogether and um, didn't write on the computer because I was so sick of the Zoom and all that stuff. Wrote longhand in a nice notebook, show it you in a minute, um, you know, with a, a proper old fountain pen. like. This this fountain pen is not fancy. It's a Schaefer fountain pen. It's got a dint, but I've had it for a long time. It, it writes really fluently, and loved it. And just had a really nice time sitting in a nice chair writing a book. It was good. So I wrote for, by making it fun. It was I've written more quickly, and um, I think I've written like the best book I've written, you know, since the first book I wrote. So. I mean, that's famous last words, isn't it? But, you know, that, that was good. That was a good side. Of, just realising that I did have access to something that was enjoyable and making sure I enjoyed it because you can end up treating privilege as a hassle, can't you? Yeah. Uh, I think you may also be the only writer I've, I've ever spoken to who has said, yeah, I've gone from writing on a laptop to just changing my mind and going back to writing longhand. I mean, obviously, there are some authors who have never made made the jump. But, you know, taking that step back because you're spending so much screen time, that did that make you write differently? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you can revise so easily on a laptop that you, as you go forward, you start thinking, oh, that's wrong. I'll go back and change that. But you're writing in a notebook, you think, oh. it looks, it'll look really messy if I cross it out. So I kept like a little, I'll show you. Hang on, let me find it. Please do. We're getting to see the process as it's happening here. This is great. Um, where's it gone? Where's it gone? Oh, there it is. I don't mind conducting the interview with an empty chair. It's wouldn't there be the it first is. time I've done it. <laughs> there it is. So, so it's a really nice notebook. Really nice wrote book, and I just wrote in it. Just I just lashed it down. It's quite messy. It's very messy. Just lashed it all down really quickly, and then, and I but I kept kind of running notes in a shitty little notebook. Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> in yeah. a rubbish little notebook. Um, so I kept like kind of running notes there, and then to keep myself off the laptop even longer, instead of typing it up, I dictate. I use dictate which you can you just speak into your phone. I just read the book into my phone 
and then <laughs> there it all was. <laughs> it's like, that seems like it, an extraordinary process. But it, and it was, you know, what was great about it is that obviously dictates pretty basic. So there were terrible, terrible uh, transcription errors, like hilarious transcription errors, and also interruptions. You know, there was like, oh, leave me alone, I'll be down in five minutes, or <laughs> all this stuff is in there. So it made revising it really fun, you know, and, it, and, and nostalgic. It's like, oh, that must have been the day when we, you know. God, I love, I love the idea that that's something that's fun and wonderful and, and, and amazing for you. Um, I, I'm going to ask, normally I ask um, um, authors when they come on about, about the, their most recent book. I mean, I want, obviously people will have, you've got like two hats. So you've got the screenwriter hat, which is, you know, the 24-hour party people, cock and bull story, um, th that world of your life, which then kind of doesn't really very much coincide with with your, no. your writing of your books as well. No, no, I'm an Amazon algorithm nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, two, you're two entirely separate spheres. So I thought maybe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the most recent thing you've had out is the paperback yeah. of Runaway Robot. Is that right? So maybe yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about the book and maybe about, because again, I'm sure a lot of people watching this, their kids will know who you are, but t tell us a little bit about, about, about that book in particular. That's, um, it's based on a true story. It's about, well, sort of based on a true thing that a guy called Captain Roberts was running a science fair in the 1920s. He just back from the First World War. And the Duke of York was supposed to come and open, this is a very long, roundabout way of telling this story, um, was supposed to come and open the, the fair and, and said, oh, I can't, I'm too busy. So Mr. Roberts just thought, oh, okay. So he built a robot <laughs> to open the fair. He built this massive, massive robot called Eric, which was a sensation. It's not really a robot, it's really an automaton. You know, it's, it does stuff, but it can't think or anything. But no one had seen anything like it before. And it's it's it was straight out of Metropolis or whatever. And people queued up to have their photograph taken with it, toured the world. And then just before the Second World War, it vanished. And I'm always interested in those little gaps in history. So I thought, oh, I, wonder what, what, I wonder what did happen to it. Because uh, it, it was big, you know, and it was treasured. It was successful. Why did it disappear? So I... Off um, you went. Yeah, well, I kind of I met a kid through a charity that I do uh, I'm involved with, who had been playing truant from school, and instead of playing truant from school by riding the night bus around the city, which all the other kids were doing, he was getting smart clothes on, taking the bus and sitting around in the airport in the departures <laughs> lounge. <laughs> so somehow those two things came to that was so stylish. And I thought this very stylish kid, and I thought, well, what if Eric the robot was just lost in lost property and what if this kid ended up getting being lumbered with this robot i was very interested in the, the idea that we, we live in a world of robots that we kind of can't see because they're invisible and they impinge on us they pack our amazon stuff and they you know we're sort of half android ourselves we outsource our sense we've all outsourced our sense of direction to the phone you know nobody looks at maps anymore all those things all those sort of things are around. It's kind of invisible and disappointing because we've been psyched up to expect the big Eric-like robot. So I just thought this very modern kid with very loads of modern kit comes across like the science fiction idea of a robot, which is actually 100 years old. So he's lumbered with this ancient robot who's got a very feudal outlook. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um so uh, I don't really know what you're going to pick in terms of books to recommend because uh, it, the criteria for every author is anything you like. There's, yeah. there's, there's no boundaries on this. So I don't know where you're going to go with this. So maybe start off at the top of the pile and, and, and give me a go of book number one. What, what, what are you going to choose? Well, go and go through this quickly, but the top of the pile is, of course it is, Erin's Diary. <laughs> this is the this is spin-off book of Derry Girls, which came in the post with... Erin's drug of choice. Oh, dip -dip wow. And, uh, you got free dip dabs as well. Yeah, I thought I'm going to try that drug. Um, so, and it's great. But you already know that. Everybody knows that. So I thought I'd start at the beginning of my reading life, which was these. <laughs> no one's done this beyond your show before. Okay. These, these are the I Spy books, which were given out, which you could sell in, like, well, they were, they were a shilling in old money. Okay. 5p, that's how old I am. And you filled them in, right? And you got points. And I'm I'm spending a lot of time in the house that I grew up in at the moment because my dad's ill and I, I spend quite a lot of time looking after him. And I'm so I end up in my old bedroom and I found these and realized that this these were great. I mean, they're ridiculous. They're insane. But 
also they made you look at things and and i think that the habit of looking was kind of accelerated by this i spy history i spy churches and 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 i part of my story is that i loved these books and i don't know why because i lived somewhere that had absolutely no history and the church was a you know a, a concrete 1960s thing because the protestants took all our churches in the reformation <laughs> and didn't allow us to build any more for hundreds of years um trees i spy trees we lived on a massive housing estate um that had no trees it was new build there were no trees were they books of fiction to you almost this they is were. something exotic See, that we don't have i think that's what it, i think now i'm realizing that that i think you've put your finger on it they were kind of books about another england that i'd like to go to and they were <laughs> there's different points right? you get a different number of points depending on how interesting something is Okay. So like everything that I could see was like maximum five points, right? But there were people who lived in a 20 point world. Do you know what I mean? So like from the birds point of view, this was a, like when we moved to this estate, we, we I grew up, lived originally in a little in a flat right by the docks in Liverpool. We moved to this housing estate and I did think it was the countryside. I thought, you know, this is Connemara, you know, mm -hmm. or oh, this is the Serengeti or something, you know, <laughs> I, but and it was, it was like lovely wide open spaces. We had gardens and everything, but there were no mature trees at all. So there were no, no birds at all. I had sat in the window with my I Spy book of birds. Like, where, where, where are they? Nothing. Nothing. And the birds were arranged in a kind of, kind of this pyramid that was like sparrows, five points, up through various tits and finches to herons and then like an osprey and then the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Yeah. at the top <laughs> <laughs> and like nothing just nothing and then the very first spring that we were there this absolutely magical thing happened that it was a housing estate that was still in the process of being built so there's tons of mud mm -hmm. so first day of spring we were just invaded by these squadrons of house martins that all built these mud nests on the side of the house. So it's like a two species housing estate. There were, there was no, there's just the two species, just humans and house martins. And the house martins were just shit. There was like poo everywhere. Mm -hmm. Guano on every doorstep and women, you know, housewives and husbands moaning about it. But um, I was just like enchanted. And, but they were like five points as well. And, and no, no matter how many there were, and we had like five nests on our house. Every nest, had, every house had like five nests. There was no accumulation. It was just like this was a single five-point event. So, anyway, so that's oh, the, you did get multiple points for that. No, okay, yeah, yeah. No, that, they, they, they look fantastic. Okay, no, they were great. Um, Where else are we going to go? I spy people is here. Absolutely no person that I was ever going to see is in that book. Bank <laughs> of England Messenger. Bank of England Messenger. Eaton Schoolboy. Westminster Choir Boy. Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah. Oh, Alaska <laughs> Sailors. They were in there. That was good. They went past that. When we lived in the <laughs> box, we could see them. So you could score highly for Alaska. Um, yeah. There you go. Yeah, Archbishop of Canterbury. He's literally in there. 20 points. There oh, okay. Is. I was making yeah. that up. Okay, right. No, no, there you go. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, African princes. Anyway, small, okay. young, this must be the Hitler youth, maybe. Yeah, but, well, no. Yeah, some kind of. Some kind of Childish paramilitary outfit. Okay, th th that, th okay, that's 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 amazing. I'm trying to figure out what the equivalent in my life would be, and, and you know, I think my first reading books were were probably okay after Ladybird books were were Famous Five books, and then kind of Secret Seven books, and Three Investigators books, and that kind of that, that kind of stuff. It definitely wasn't as exotic as those, and I definitely don't still have them. Um, okay, so where else are we going to go with this? What else? What, what else is your, uh, your your choice for number two? Oh, what else is on the desk? Yeah. Okay, let me think. Well, what else is here? What can I surprise you with? What's, um, I loved this. This this was this is the sequel to the Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. I loved the Wizard of Earthsea. The Wizard of Earthsea completely. Do you know that book? The Wizard of Earthsea. It's it, 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 it's still sitting downstairs. I bought it about four and a half years ago. I had this conversation in an earlier episode of Shelf Analysis about Ursula Le Guin. She's who come with, up more with, than who once. With. I'm trying to remember who it was. Maybe my other half downstairs should should remember. But you know, I, I definitely haven't read it, and it's still in the TBR, and it's going to get read over Christmas. And the Wizard of Earthsea is an absolutely astounding book. Um, it's about a school for wizards, and I think what's amazing about it is. I mean, she had a kind of anthropological background. Her father was a famous anthropological an anthropologist, Theodore Kerber. 
and he so she kind of under, she really thought about how people think so the magic in the wizard of earth sea is really convincing i know that sounds mad but it's it's you're convinced by the magic because there are two kinds of magic there's illusion which is sort of flashy showy offy um magic like in a kid's book and there's there's another kind of magic which is about understanding things and really and knowing their real name and uh, it's just a beautiful beautiful book with the best map of any book because it's set in because like there are a lot of fantasy books that i loved the maps were always a bit pants weren't they the map of middle earth yeah good map goes a long way at the beginning of books like that yeah yeah but like the map of middle earth is ridiculous it's just you know bad bit good bit mountains it's just like oh yeah really? Sarah. yeah yeah what is that and narnia even worse although both of them had great ear for place names didn't they so the maps were rubbish but the geography somehow got into your head and that was beautiful um but she the, the wizard of earth is set in the archipelago so the map and she drew the map first is is the map of a vast archipelago and that that all the transport is like short voyages and i did actually tapped into that but it's just such a brilliant brilliant thing that he's a sailor but it's that kind of really attractive you know short voyages knowing the wind knowing the rocks coracle type cora type sailing you know really really the, the sailing that's in the odyssey you know even though he sails for 10 years it's island hopping isn't it mm -hmm. so it's all that and the map is just amazing the magic's amazing she's a peerless peerless look writer ursula green she's fantastic and this is the sequel tombs of Atuam, which isn't okay. as widely read and it's astounding it's it's so vivid that it feels like one of my own memories it doesn't feel like a book that i read it feels like something i experienced and i've only i think i've reread it maybe twice but it feels so imprinted in my head it's an amazing thing that's, that's great my, my wife isn't 100 sure she's sending me a message here she said yeah he was she was mentioned recently it might have been neil gaiman not sure Ne maybe neil gaiman mentioned her recently and someone's gonna do me for that yeah they are okay where are we going after after ursula Le Guin? oh gosh we're, we're rocketing through here nah, we? well that's okay if you need if you need it if you need to have a glass of water you fire ahead i'm not no no um this is this is a book from this year this has just come out aj lee's brazil that never was and aj lee's is a neuroscientist who as a kid was obsessed with a writer called colonel percy fawcett who believed he had found or believed he had sort of located um that thing that everyone claims they've located um a lost city in amazonia and as a kid he read this aj lee's wrote read Percy's book and became obsessed with this kind of imaginary Brazil which is like the imaginary England that you have just told me that I was obsessed with which I've only just realized when I mean, you've completely changed my life I totally <laughs> no that is what you're right that's what was going on I was reading a fiction book and trying to make it come true you know I was trying to find the church with the you know, started the, in the 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 yeah the church with the Norman Lancet <laughs> that i was like like you know like, and you go in the back of the wardrobe thinking there must be one wardrobe somewhere that actually works so that's what try yeah. every single one to get there yeah and you wanted it to be true so he kind of wanted it to be true aj lee and um so it's about you know growing up obsessed with that it, 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 and he grew up in liverpool and he's older than i am even even older than i am so he's got these astonishing descriptions in it of a very, very vividly recollected Liverpool that is like right, right at the farthest edge of my memory. And and it's probably not direct memories. It's probably things that other people have described. Um, so it kind of, it's turning Liverpool into a kind of glamorous lost city to me by reading this book because it's so vivid and it's it's such a poetic imagination and i'm trying to find this bit there's a bit um there used to be this famous dockland railway called the overhead railway people used to call it the dockers umbrella uh because the dockers could stand under it and be sheltered and um uh, it, and that was this dismantled before i was born so he's got this amazing description of traveling along it 
that I'll try and find and read to you. Please because do. Because, and I, I drive home, if I drive home, along the road that is the path of that railway. And it, there are miles and miles and docks in Liverpool, my, and miles of them. It's very unusual. Um, and all behind this huge, huge wall. So you, you can't see what's behind them. So it's always got this kind of exotic, mysterious, ruined, lost city feel to it anyway. And that the overhead railway went over as high as that wall. So you could see in and see all these um, ships that are coming in. Hang on. Are you telling me that Liverpool isn't just the Albert Dock? I presume that was the only dock you had there. That no, that was, that was the, the very, one I walked very, around. That was the very last dock. That's that, that's kind of in town. Um, I should have I should have marked this up, shouldn't I? I'm being foolish. Ah, post it would have gone a long way, but you know we're here now, so I'm okay with that. We are here. I'll leave it. I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna kill the vibe, aren't I? If I don't, if I keep, I'll try and find it and come back to it. I know it's. I just thought it was on the first page, but it's not. Anyway. Oh, there you go. Okay. So he's describing being on this little railway. We made our way along the line of lorries and climbed the viaduct footbridge to Wapping Station. That's, that's the Albert Dock, this big archway there where it would have been. And after a short wait on the windswept platform, boarded motor coach 24 for the overhead railway ride to Seaforth, which is where I am. Two sailors sat on the wooden seats beside us on their way to Africa. And I read the names of the stations, Custom House, James Street, Clarence, Nelson, Canada, Brocklebank, which used to be the Irish boat, Alexandria and Gladstone, as we snaked around the dock estate. Each dock was its own citadel. Typhu, tea chests, boxes of five bananas and sacks of grain suspended on hooks of cranes moved slowly through the fume-filled air above the ships. Below the viaduct, a horse was pulling a cart of cast iron. On the city side, we watched clerks rooted to their desks in Bible black buildings and a group of women on their way to clean a liner. I'll talk about that. Even with red and green 3D glasses, Saturday matinees at the Rex could never compare with the ride on the Pneumonia Express for pure cinema. More than Comanches coming over the balcony, it seemed to me that King Kong might sweep up out of the carriage, uh, sweep up and take me out of the carriage as the gooder gooder of the electric train on the track flashed from the arcing conductors and the rattle of the wooden windows. Amazing. It's amazing. That it's was amazing, worth waiting for. That's super. And reminds and the name kind of the proximity of, um, of sea and, and housing, I found kind of amazing that, you know, like, and I can just about remember that kind of world of like people who would be sitting in a flat and hear that a particular boat had come in and, and run down to ask if there were jobs on it. Mm -hmm. I, and my auntie, my 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 dad's sister used to clean ships and they would go on, they'd be taken on a ship to clean. And if the slot came up and they had to go, those women would stay on it and then be taken off by a lighter and then brought back up the river. And I find that like... <laughs> Amazing. That's mind blowing, isn't it? Hugely. Pretend none of that ever happened. And none I'm going to go, I'm going to go, what was that book called again, Frank? It was called A Brazil That Never Was by AJ Lees. Okay, what's happening next? About the liminal space between <laughs> conversations. It's, it's because even though this is live, I can edit this out later on. Someone who watches okay, this at eight o'clock tonight, they, they, they won't know any of this okay. happened, apart from us talking about it right now. Uh, okay. what, what, what's your next book? What have you got for us? What have I got? We're rattling, rattling through. Um, let me see. Well, okay, so we're going to go for more kind of childhood stuff. Um, Great. Comet in Moonland by Tuvi Janssen. Oh, lovely. Which, which is this gorgeous edition by Sort Up Books, which um, I only had kind of the puffin book, which was great, but it wasn't as lavish as this and certainly didn't have that gorgeous print. Oh, um, Does it have those fancy edges? It doesn't. It, it's on thick paper. Yeah, it's on right. lovely paper. It's gorgeous. It's lovely. a gorgeous book. And it's got a picture of Tuvi Janssen in the back. Which, oh, wow. I didn't have when I was little. So I didn't know that Tuva Janssen was a woman or indeed a human <laughs> because she was called Tove. And I just thought she's probably like quite like a moomin, maybe. Space alien. Yeah. Who writes moomin books. Yeah. yeah, I know. And I guess there's no, like everybody knows how amazing these books are now. But I think for me growing up, there, there was that thing of like that really great children's books do have, like say Little Women has. Um, or I mean, actually, in Blighton books as well. 
that they give you this kind of map of what you could be. They give you a kind of um, an anatomy of human beings or human possibilities. Like you could be, you know, Joe, the great writer, or you could be Meg or, you know, and I think the movement books are definitely, definitely like that. So they offered you these characters who were all kind of attractive in different ways, but they were all different aspects of being a human, even though none of them was a human. So this Snufkin who kind of wanders off, you know, when the others hibernate, he goes wandering mysteriously and never tells you where he's been and comes back with the spring. And that that's the one that you kind of wanted to be when you're a teenager. And then there's Moomin Papa, who's kind of ridiculous and pompous, but good hearted. And there's Moomin Mama, who can solve everything. Uh, there's these sort of big, loud, noisy hemulins. There are Philly Jonks, who are kind of neurotic and little. And most of all, there's little Mai, who is this tiny very fearsome, very fast talking little tiny girl who was like, um, everything was, she thought that everything, everyone was doomed, but that was quite funny. So she'd be like, you know, there's going to be a volcano, you're going to drown in lava, it's going to be hilarious. So she's like, uh, I, I like a goth on speed. And I kind of a huge crush on her. I know that sounds weird now, but I did quite fancy little my, and on my first day at university, I met someone who looked just like her, and we got married. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> as, as somebody whose world has never had the Moomins in it, I'm going to be honest with you, they were never part of my world as a kid no. and as a reader growing up. Is it too late to, to grab on at 47? Well, it, I mean, in a way, well, you won't get that. You won't get that kind of like, this is what your life can be, you know, and you won't get that kind of, but they're brilliant pieces of writing. They're amazing pieces. Of, I mean, she's she is a very great artist. Um, her adult books are brilliant. Her paintings are wonderful. The visuals in these books are, you know, astounding. Some of my favorite pictures in the world are the illustrations that she did for the Moomin books. She's just a gigantically great artist. So you're never gonna lose by engaging with her. And, and what she did that I find kind of very moving is that she, she kind of accidentally had this huge success like a lot of writers do that wasn't exactly the success she wanted. If you, if you know what I mean, like Solo Way, you know, Conan Doyle fancied himself as a kind of great historical novelist, ended up saddled with Sherlock Holmes, Wh whatever, you know, it's as if Bowie had been defined by the Laughing Gnome or something like that. Yeah. That's what happened to Tufa Janssen. She was defined by the Laughing Gnome. And, um, but she swallowed it. She didn't try and kill the movements off or anything like that. She just decided to put everything of herself into the Moomin books. So this, like, Comet in Moomin Land is about this huge... And, and the reason I picked Comet in Moomin Land is that it's about recovering from a great disaster, which hopefully we're about to do. <laughs> it's about, you know, it's about the world coming back together. And it's written after the Second World War, which is... She's finished and it's in Finland. So that's why I picked that one. But, you know, there's Moomin Land November. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing very funny but also quite harrowing book where over the series quite a lot of people i'm calling them people you know creatures have become kind of emotionally dependent on the moomins and always go to their house when they wake up from their hibernation and they're kind of like odd that you know that they're the lonely and the rum and and they're tolerated in the moomin house and they go in moomin valley moomin land moomin valley november sorry and the Moomins aren't there. And they're just this group of waifs and strays kind of acting as though the Moomins might come back any minute. And it's like, it's an amazing book about loss and she wrote it just after her mother died. So, it, it, I mean, it's it's just astounding piece of work. And as a kid, you could, well, as a kid, it was very disorientating because I'd read Finn Family Moomin Troll, which is all jolly about Hobgoblin's hats and lost emeralds and stuff like this. And then I read this one, it's like, what? Yeah. Like, you know, what if it, it was like reading a Narnia book and it's like, yeah, Aslan is a complete fraud. It's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a guy in a lion suit. Yeah, it's a guy in a lion suit. And actually, the witch is fine. <laughs> um, maybe just before we, we finish up tonight, have you got one more that you'd like to recommend for us? If you've got yes. one more from, from what you have there, that'd be great. I've got, yeah. Um, I don't know which one to pick now. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go for this. I see. I'm putting. I'm holding this up. This is Norman Lewis, a dragon apparent. But I, what I wanted to hold up 
was Norman Lewis, Naples 44, which I contend is the greatest book ever written and, um, and is very timely. And the reason I can't hold it up is that every time I get a copy, if I really, if I meet someone you and I really like them, that's the biggest thing. I, the best way I can tell them that they, I want them to be in my life is to give them a copy of that book. Yeah, I've, I've never, I've, and I, it's it's always gone. But if you don't know it, it's um, Norman Lewis, great travel writer, was an intelligence officer with the Allies um, when they landed in Sicily, uh, and and travelled on to Naples and, and became an officer in Naples in 1944. And Naples was in a terrible state; it had been occupied by the Germans. Uh, as they left, they wrecked everything. They destroyed all the electricity. They touched the ground behind them, and, and and including the water supply. So there was an outbreak of typhoid. But on top of that, it was Naples, which is you know a big, bustling modern city with a with a, a soul of the Bronze Age. You know, full of haunted by revenge and magic and madness and he is, uh, Norman Lewis is the guy whose job it is to assess whether women who claim they want to marry British or American soldiers are bona fide or not, or are they just trying to get out of, of Naples? And so he has to sort of get under the skin of the Neapolitan way of life in these horrendous conditions. And nearly every single page makes you go, what? They did what? <laughs> and but and also every page has got these amazing, moving, beautiful, beautiful stories. He's got an incredible eye, and Naples at any time. And we're talking tonight, the night that Maradona died, um, who I saw play in Naples uh, the night they won Serie A, and that was, I mean, obviously it was a great football occasion, but it was also voodoo. I mean, like. I don't know really what was going on there, but it was very like what would be going on around Stonehenge or Tara or something like that. It was just mental. Um, and so Naples is always astounding, but like Naples after aerial bombardment with a typhoid epidemic, you know, was just like, you've never had, it's astounding. It's just an amazing, amazing book. Okay, so that's Norman Lewis, Naples 44, is, is the Lewis. one you're recommending. Before before I let you go, hang on a second. So obviously Diego Maradona has passed away, uh, or was announced earlier on, he was only 60. Um, but you saw him play. So I, the I night, definitely... The night they won. So, so tell me a little bit about that. The night they won Serie A. Yeah. Um, it, it was, I don't remember anything about the football. I just remember just this unbelievable kind of, spasm of I'm, I'm just like the weirdness the weirdness of Naples and the hatred and love and drama of it they had these huge banners that were SPQR right like Senate and the people of Rome Sony Porky Questi Romani Romans are pigs it's like lads that's a 2000 year old joke you know um so I could, I, have we got a minute? Shall I tell you the story? Yes, the absolutely okay. we do. So we, you leave the ground, you came back into town uh, along Mergalina, which is like where there's a little arbour and all that stuff. And there's a dual carriage. It's like a waterfront dual carriageway. And and we left through a tunnel. Like, I mean, this is, uh, uh, th these are apocalyptic memories. This is like when I read Dante's Inferno, which would have been the next thing, I see trying to get home from that game. I was in Naples. I was there. I was in Naples at the time. Anyway, you know, I'd gone to this game, and um, I, like you left through a tunnel, and there, there were like scooters, hundreds and I know that like people think Italian traffic is bad. You've no idea, right? You've not a clue. There were like scooters skittering through like little bats, all with like four or five young lads on, beautifully groomed young lads, dangerous looking young lads, and they would like they would like slip off and sit on your bonnet and wait for the next scooter to come because the traffic was like moving so slowly they'd get off and walk over cars and it was just it was like some kind of weird Balladian nightmare then we got out of the tunnel and we're on in this dual carriageway and all the traffic going into town is just stopped right just completely stopped but traffic going out of town is flowing the guy behind my car forward into the next car because I was next to like one of those little gaps in the central reservation. And he just drove onto the wrong side of the road with his horn going. 
and the car behind him did the same and the car behind him did the same and they just took the other side of the dual carriageway and it all cleared it's like what naples naples and i was staying in i was staying in a flat on like uh, and i was right up on the top floor and even the double glazing top floor maybe 20 floors up couldn't sleep a wink you it was <laughs> I mean, I've been to a war zone and this, it was quiet by comparison, <laughs> just like endless, endless, endless car horns and fireworks and craziness. And this, this Maradona thing had been like, well, it, it was like something from an ancient myth, you know, that a God had incarnated himself on the pitch for them and vanquished thousands of years of resentment. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, my, it was just crazy. I think that's quite an extraordinary way to, to, to finish up. It's been really, really lovely talking to you again. And uh, I hope all goes well over the course of the next few months and with the book and with everything that comes from that. Are you doing screenwriting stuff as well at the moment? Or is that a little bit, but I'm, you know, I'm primarily a children's writer. I've got a film. I've got a film that's about to go into shoot about the Homeless World Cup, which oh, was originally an Irish movie because the Irish Homeless World Cup team mm. are very special, but we've kind of changed over the years. But... <laughs> Fantastic. Frank Carroll Boyce, thank you so much for taking the time out tonight to have a chat with me. And I really thank appreciate you, Rick. it. And talk to you soon. And hopefully, again, I keep saying this to people, that's one of those things we could get to do in the real world at a real festival. Um, a, lot, a lot longer doing that. Thank you to Frank Carroll, Carroll Boyce for that. Um, a couple of things I want to remind you of very, very quickly before we finish up on shelf analysis tonight. Um, here we go. It's here. There you go. Um, don't forget, if you are uh, knocking around uh, a little bit later on, oh, not that one there. Sorry, Frank, put you in, took you out. That's the one. There we go. Um, tonight, the reason we had the show on a little bit earlier than usual, it is the Unpost Irish Book Awards. It is happening at 7.30 tonight. So that's in 15, 14 minutes time uh, over on RTE Culture. Just go to rte.ie slash culture. You'll be able to watch tonight's ceremony hosted by Evelyn O'Rourke. Best of luck to everybody who is involved. All of the people I like. Uh, and there's no people I don't like involved in the Irish Book Awards because everybody's amazing and they're all fantastic. And one more thing before we go. Uh, this time next week on Shelf Analysis, where have I got? There we go. It's going to be episode 50. Is it 56 next week? Episode 56 with the wonderful Sinead Burke is going to be my guest. That is next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Back to our usual time uh, on next Wednesday. Thanks so many for watching. Really appreciate it. Catch you back on RTE Gold tomorrow morning from 10 a.m. Uh, as per usual. And other than that, that's it. Best of luck. Off to watch the Book Awards. See you then. Good luck. Thanks a million.